Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Ord. I work for CPA Australia uh, as, a, as our business and investment policy manager. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank ASIO for organising this webinar. Hopefully today you'll get something interesting from, from this webinar, particularly the business implications of COVID-19 and how it could help you. I encourage you to um, put any questions in the chat box and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. So again, I, I repeat that I'd like to thank ASIO for organising this presentation and to Brenda and Anna for their assistance in getting this presentation up and running. Uh, also, there will be a, an article in your upcoming edition of the ASIO magazine, uh, which goes into some a uh, bit more depth on some of the issues we'll raise today. So I'll just move on. So. The outline of today is we'll um, have a quick economic overview of where, we're, where Australia is at. Uh, then we go into what we call the three R's, respond to COVID-19, recovery from COVID-19 and reinventing your business, the three R's. After that, the recommendations, some CPI Australia resources and a Q&A after that. So on Australia's economy, so fair to say that Australia's economy is, is not doing great. And in particular that Victoria is holding back the Australian economy at this point in time. So this is reflected in, in, in sorry, this is reflected in uh, this slide. I don't know if you can see the, the right hand column, but the very right hand column shows Australia's economy uh, declined by 7% in the June quarter of 2020. So this is a, a, a record decline. Never has Australia declined by so much. Uh, and that's, but Australia, obviously, Australia is obviously not alone in that. The US, Europe, uh, and parts of Asia have also declined significantly over the last, um, since March, February. Now, we are seeing some signs of recovery in the US and definitely in China. So some very good signs in China around recovery. Um, and, but the uh, recovery doesn't mean it's going back to where it was. Recovery means we might go back to around 90%, 95% of where we were. So I do expect that in the third quarter of 2020 this year, that there will be a rebound in the Australian economy. However, that obviously will be held back by the Victorian shutdown. Uh, and, but we're also not likely to see Australia to recover to where we were until sometime late in 2021. Now this slide here is looking at jobs. And this is from the ABS. And uh, this is um, the decrease in jobs from 14th of March 2020. So that's the day that Australia recorded 100 COVID cases through to 22nd of August. Now I'm not, not sure if you can see the, the full chart, but what, what you should see on the right hand side is that Victoria, is, the number of jobs in Victoria is down around 8% from where it was on the 14th of March, but for the rest of Australia, it's down around about 2.8, 2.9%. So again, this is sort of reflects that Victoria is a drag on the rest of the economy and the rest of Australia. Um, but it also shows that once Victoria starts to reopen, uh, that could be you know, from the 26th of March, or 20, sorry, 26th of October or the 23rd of November, that there will be a steady pickup in jobs. But it will be some time before we get back to where we were in, in, in February, March this year. Uh, this chart here shows where what industries have been hit hardest by COVID-19 and no surprise that the accommodation and food services businesses have been hit hardest. We can see that nearly 40% of jobs in that industry have been lost in Victoria in the last six months. 40% of those jobs, even with JobKeeper. If you include JobKeeper in there, so if you took JobKeeper out, you'll be looking at a much even higher percentage. Other industries which have suffered a lot are arts and recreation services as well. On the plus side, there's only two industries which are on the plus side of the equation. So electricity, gas and water, essentially you know, government 
while they're privatised mostly, but they're also government owned, government controlled and financial services uh, has seen a slight increase in number of employees. Now, uh, that's primarily due to the industry going through having to put on extra staff to deal with compliance obligations, particularly uh, loan deferral applications. Now, it's highly likely that in 2021, we're going to see some of these large corporates start to reduce their headcount. And that's because we, we move into a more traditional recession. We've really, we've, at the moment, we're in a recession caused by government policy. Uh, in the next few months, we'll start to shift more into a traditional recession uh, where demand is down. And for those who may recall the recessions of the early 90s and the early 80s, uh, there's quite a long lag so that corporates will start to cut their headcount and it could be a few years before we see uh, employment going back to where it was, unemployment going back to where it was. Uh, and, and another thing about the recession is it's been 29 years since Australia has been through a recession. So there's a, a very large section of the Australian workforce which have never managed through a recession. So th this is going to be a challenging period for many businesses who don't actually have any, the experience in dealing with um, a significant downturn. This slide here is on uh, changing jobs by size of the employer. That sort of maroon line, I can't describe the colour, but that they're large businesses. And you can see that for the large corporates, they're, they're basically back to where they were in March in terms of number of employees. So it really is the SME sector, those two green lines, which are suffering the most. Both of them are down around 8%. So it is really, at the moment, a problem that uh, the SME sector is facing the most. They're struggling the most. Again, if you put take out JobKeeper, uh, that, that percentage will be quite, that number of job losses will be much higher. As I said before, for the large sector, um, we expect that going into 2021, that we, we're likely to see some fairly large job cuts in the corporate sector in 2021. This is the ASX 200. So to give you a view of how the stock market has reacted to the crisis. And obviously the stock market is not necessarily a guide to where the economy is at at this point in time, but where they think the economy might head. You can see from, and this is for data for this year, you can see it around about February 21st, 22nd, that's when the stock market started to crash. As US cases started to skyrocket, as well as Italy, in Spain and France. So and that, that collapsed until somewhere around late March. And for Australia, it's been a steady but slow increase from there, but it still hasn't gone, it's still well below where we were in February. To the US, if you look at the US SP 500, the US stock market, it's basically recovered where it was. So, um, it says here my audio has been lost completely. Oh, sorry, audio was lost there for a moment. The main difference between the Australian so, stock market and the US right. stock market is the heavy tech sector. Sorry. Uh, so in the US, there's a much larger tech sector than in Australia. And the tech sector has attracted a lot of investment because they've been a net beneficiary of the uh, people working from home. This slide here is uh, retail sales. And I don't know, don't know if you can see the right hand corner, but the red columns represent what's happened since March. And you can see that in Australia, month. Uh, retail sales have largely held up. There's been some variations, but they're largely held up. And that's primarily due to a lot of government money flowing around in the system. And it's not just about JobKeeper and the increase in JobSeeker, but also the early access to super. So we are hearing from members, for example, that uh, sales of secondhand jet skis have gone through the roof 
that uh, some businesses who are selling jet, jet skis are never being busier. So people are taking their $10,000 from super and putting into jet skis. And the other reason the, online, the retail sector is held up is a, is a large shift to rent uh, online sales. Again, if you look at that right-hand column, you'll see that online sales have increased around about 50% from March through to today. So there's been a big consumer shift to online, and obviously that's at the expense of uh, bricks, you know, traditional bricks and mortar investment. Now heading into the roadmap, our roadmap to recovery. So CPA Australia have put together a roadmap on business recovery. And we and we know that the roadmap is not straight. We know that it's going to be twists and turns and bumps in the road. And this, we've designed it like that. And for us, there are what, what, what we call the three R's, respond, recover, and reinvent. Now for some businesses, it's quite, it'll be the best outcome for them that they actually exit the business. Now, if you are in financial difficulty, exiting a business is an option and it's a legitimate option. And the earlier you make the decision, the better it is for you. So I'm not, so, I'm not just encouraging you to exit, but I want you to consider that it isn't a, a legitimate business option if you are in financial difficulty. And given the financial shock, the economic shock we've been through, it is very much a legitimate option at this stage. So we move into the response phase. So this is more to do with businesses in the lockup phase in Victoria, the, the being locked down in Victoria. For businesses outside Victoria, they, they would have moved on to the recovery phase. But in this in this uh, more immediate response phase, the focus is very much on cash flow. So we'll talk more about that. So the focus at this stage is on cash flow and managing that cash flow. So if you are in lockdown, what should you do right now? Well, the main thing is to prepare regular cash flow forecasts. Now, you might traditionally do a cash flow forecast monthly or even quarterly. But I think at this stage, particularly if you're in lockdown in Melbourne, and maybe in some other areas where you're in financial difficulty, Maybe look at doing it weekly. And we do know that in uh, February, March, some businesses were actually doing daily cash flow for forecasts because their business was so precarious. And in doing those forecasts, put in place some scenarios. So you know, the, the best case scenario is that the lockdown restrictions are lifted uh, on, on the dates the government have set, and we go back to some degree of normality. That's the best case scenario. The, you know, the better case scenario is we, the, an effective vaccine is uh, developed and is available widely. And that's, you know, that becomes available widely by you know, early next year. The worst case scenario, and this is re relevant to all businesses in all areas, is that we have a third or fourth wave of COVID and that COVID may mutate into a more deadly strain. So that is always a scenario and I think we have to look at those best case, worst case, and even that, you know, what somebody said to me, catastrophic case, that a more deadly strain of COVID uh, was to emerge. And you factor those into your cash flow, so you have the different scenarios and how, how the business would look. Look at, uh, um, and once you, once you know your cash position, then look at tasks to, how do you reduce cash flow pressure? So that's two aspects, there is the money coming and also controlling the money coming out. Or when you've done the cash flow forecast, you would also be a better understanding of do you need funding, ex extra funding from banks, for example, and when you will need that funding and how much. Now, if you do discover in your forecasting that you're going to need some money from banks, go and apply early. Uh, we do know that it's a difficult, a long-winded process at this point in time to get money from banks. and if you delay the process, you're unli unlikely to get the money you need. But given the difficulty in accessing funding from banks, you might want to look at other alternatives such as possibly selling assets, uh, entering a payment plan with the ATO, 
or, or even looking at government grants, because there's quite a lot of government grants. Also look at um, what payments can be deferred, uh, particularly around rent and loans, but I'll go into that a bit later. I did mention government assistance. There's quite a lot of government assistance going around beyond JobKeeper. Uh, the various states have various grants available at this point in time, and I encourage you to have a look at that. And, how, and so now we move on to how can cash flow be improved. Uh, now there's probably nothing unusual or something you don't know already here, but sometimes I find it better just to re reiterate some of these key key issues. Contact your debtors, ask them to pay, cut costs. So be careful in cutting costs. You know, there's the old saying, penny wise, pound foolish. So don't cut your costs so much that it affects your operations. A lot of businesses have been reducing capital expenditure. Uh, that's been possible, but not in all areas. So a lot of businesses have had to increase their capital expenditure in the technology space, unplanned capital expenditure. And that's because of remote working. I mentioned before about seeking payment deferrals, uh, but if possible, seek payment waivers. Payment deferrals, well, all they do is just kick the can down the road. So uh, you may not necessarily, you may just create a cash flow problem down later. Um, so obviously you can seek payment deferrals or even waivers from your suppliers, landlords, particular lenders, and even on tax as well. So at, uh, payroll taxes and uh, income taxes, for example. Get some finance, so that could be from an investor, it could be from a bank, but probably the um, government finance is one of the key areas of accessing at least some short-term working capital finance. Um, the next one on this uh, little diagram is look to reduce staff costs. Now, with JobKeeper starting to come off at the end of this month, um, and it will find more businesses no longer receiving JobKeeper, that um, it's going to mean businesses have to seriously look at their staffing costs because they won't have that financial support from the government. Um, and uh, like, as you know, JobKeeper has been extended through to March, but the level of support has been reduced and the you have to retest for a JobKeeper. So not every business is going to requalify. And think about outside the box. So in, in discussing this uh, presentation with uh, Brenda, and Anna, they gave the example of security businesses which have uh, shifted into cleaning, for example. So there are businesses in your sector which are quite active in looking at different ways to make some extra money at this point in time. So I mentioned about deferral of payments. So speak to your suppliers about whether you can defer payment or even reduce supplies or uh, delay orders. In each state, there is a commercial rent relief scheme where the landlord is required for most businesses to pass on a rental waiver and deferral equivalent to your reduction in, in rent. Uh, if you haven't already done so, uh, contact your tenant, sorry, contact your landlord to seek a, re a reduction in, in your rent payable. But try and make sure as much of that is possible as a rental waiver rather than deferral. Um, don't, when you speak to your lender, don't just ask for a deferral, but maybe a renegotiation or re restructuring of your credit facility. Maybe try and seek a lower interest rate at this point in time. Many, many businesses are taking advantage of a tax deferral, entering payment plans for the tax office uh, as a way to boost their cash position. Now, the, one of the risks of doing this is that um, if you do take out a payment plan with the ATO, it could actually impact your ability to seek finance after from a bank. So you might enter a payment plan and then the business starts to, the, your business starts to go well and you might want to, you know, some equipment financing. If you do have a payment plan, it's highly likely that the bank will not lend to you an ATO payment plan. So if you have an ATO payment plan, it's highly likely a bank will not lend to you. So there are risks in entering that. But the experience from uh, people who've entered payment plans, it's a five minute conversation with a tax office. In comparison, you might take five weeks to get a similar um, line of credit from a bank. 
And just uh, the last point there is keep track of your deferrals. So it is really effectively, if you're just deferring payments, kicking can, can down the road, uh, you might just create a cash flow problem later on. Uh, restructure. I mean, it's a cliche now, but never waste a good crisis. And as I said, it might be a cliche, but it actually is quite meaningful. It's a chance to relook at your business and say, these areas are not working. Uh, let's uh, shift resources from that area to another area. Or well, this area is really going well, let's put more resources into that. So it is an opportunity to get over maybe some of the internal politics that might make it difficult, might usually make it difficult to restructure and refocus the business on those areas which are doing well and move money out or resources out of those areas which are not going to do well. So now we're business recovery. So for most of Australia, most businesses are in this phase. They've gone through the initial phase and now they're in the recovery phase. And in the recovery phase, keeping control of your financial position is still highly relevant, but it, it moves more into a focus on strategy and how do you uh, improve your business model to take advantage of the change in the environment. But one thing that's important to remember is the business you take, the business you had before COVID will be different to the business you have after COVID. And the same goes for your customers and your suppliers as well. So you have to keep that in mind and factor that into your recovery and beyond. So during the recovery phase, we're likely to see, you're likely to have questions from your suppliers and customers around whether for example, can you continue to supply as you have? You might have customers asking for discounts, customers asking you to do things in different ways. Um, there's still going to be uncertainty, but less so than before in the initial crisis. So now you have a pretty good idea of how your business is going to react to a crisis, how your business, sorry, how your business will be impacted by, for example, a third or fourth wave of COVID. But there's still uncertainties. Uh, customer demand and your operational capacity, you'll be questions around that. Customer demand is obviously going to change during the recovery phase. And as I said before, you still need to continuously monitor your financial performance. It's still, I could say it's precarious at this moment. And I suggest that you continue to monitor your performance on a regular basis and a more regular basis than what you did before COVID-19. And, and that includes cash flow forecasting and I'd suggest that you should, uh, should at least continue to do it weekly uh, if, if you can. And it's also the perfect time in the recovery to look at alternate revenue streams. So as I said before, the example of a security company moving into cleaning or else, or otherwise, as I said before, focusing more on core business. So that means letting go of particular areas, unprofitable areas of your business. So the financial position of financial health. So it's very important you keep, I mean, I'm an accountant, so you know, you know I'm gonna say this, but very important to keep your financial records up. It's essential because you can use those financial records to determine your financial health and to compare how your business is performing against uh, others in your industry. And you can do that through a ratio analysis. So at the end of this presentation, there's links to a number of CPA resources, which has uh, links to common ratios that you can look at. Now, there's some sort of common questions. Um, if you're a director of a business, the solvency test is very important this time. So that's basically, do you have enough cash to cover your debts as they become due and payable? Uh, do you know your margins and how do they compare against your uh, competitors in the industry, in your industry? Now, I do, I do mention benchmarks there. Um, the problem with benchmarks at this point in time is that that data is based on pre-COVID data. So the benchmarks are not as valuable as they once were, but they are still indicative. So I don't dismiss them, 
but they are not they are indicative more than uh, gospel, as they say. Uh, and look at your return on investment. What is your return on investment? Is is it still effective? Can you get a, a return, a better return on your investment? So now you look at your financial health, then you look at your operations and look at ways to improve the effectiveness of your business operations. Now, in many sectors, is the question is around, is their online presence strong enough to meet uh, the demand? Not necessarily an issue in all sectors, but it is an issue in a lot of sectors, such as the accounting sector. Uh, how do you improve operational efficiency? So go and speak to your staff. A lot of your staff would have good ideas on how to improve operational efficiency and encourage you to speak to them. Uh, and look at obviously your staffing levels, particularly once uh, JobKeeper starts to be withdrawn, do you have the right staffing levels to, um, to support your customer needs? Once you've done that internal evaluation, have a look at your uh, your market, the external situation. Because it, it will have changed, and with those changes, are your business is your business ready to meet those changes? So have a look at how your customers are going. Are they reopening their businesses? Are they reopening their businesses in the same way? How are your competitors going? And it's important to note that the recovery will not be uniform. Have a look at how customers have changed as well. So, yeah, for example, in the retail sector, so we mentioned before about the shift to online. So we do know that in the retail sector that um, there's, a, <coughs> there's a definite trend, a hastening of the trend away from the traditional shop front to warehousing. How will that impact upon uh, your customers' demand for your services if if they're having less shop front work, but more warehousing work. Also, they're doing a lot more online sales, so electronic sales, so less cash, physical cash changing hands. How does that impact upon your sector as well? And obviously, all these raises cybersecurity issues. So all these need to be considered as well. So there's definitely a very much a, chain, a changing in business environment that, that has been changing for quite some time, but COVID-19 has hastened this digital rollout, this uh, in technology, in the greater focus on um, automation. And that's gonna flow through to all sectors in varying degrees. So the question is, how do you, um, do you need to change your business to the new environment? It's also the perfect opportunity to uh, look at, ask yourself the question, what do you want your business to be after COVID-19? Before uh, answering that question, you should do a few steps, like do a SWOT analysis. Do a SWOT analysis of your business at this point in time. And maybe even do a SWOT analysis of where your business was, was at in February or January. And just compare the two, see how your business has shifted. And this will then inform whether your business model is still the right business model, help inform that. Also, we have down there business goals. Are they realistic? Definitely look at your business goals. Uh, if in the eyes of staff, if your business goals are unrealistic, they become disengaged because they just say, well, we can't meet those goals. So you may need to re refashion your goals to, uh, to make them more achievable. Is your customer base still in intact? So we looked at certain industries which are, are highly impacted, like accommodation, food services. Will those businesses continue on in 2020, 2021? And for some, they won't. And this all feeds into around your business model. Is your business model still relevant? And will it help you to survive in this recovery period and thrive beyond? So here are some examples from our members around some of the business strategies they're implementing in their businesses. Now, obviously they're not necessarily relevant to you, but you might get the germ of a good idea from some of these top points. So I mentioned about the shift to online commerce. 
there's definitely a strong shift on my commerce, not just in the retail sector, but even in the services sector as well. So in our accounting sector, we're seeing a shift on online commerce. Um, you know, we've got telehealth and other things. So there's there's that shift to online commerce. And also a greater reliance on social media to promote the business. The, the one strong thing that has come through from engagement from all members has been they're focusing more on their customer engagement. And they're doing that because Primarily, they want to know more about how customer behaviour is changing. And so they need to be engaged with their customer on a regular basis. And to back up that increased customer engagement, they're focusing, putting more money into analytical tools, digital tools, which can give you real-time trends and intelligence on sales and marketing and customer trends. And that then can feed you through, through to your product development. We're also hearing a lot more focusing on auto automation. And while this was a trend before COVID, it's really picked up in the last few months. The businesses are investing or planning to invest more in automation. And that's uh, partly to increase efficiency and reduce costs. And it's not just around automation in a manufacturing sector, it's also automation in, say, bookkeeping, um, even in HR and things like that. Well, next two dot points are, are around uh, mergers and acquisitions. So businesses are looking to buy their suppliers to um, help protect their supply chain, but they're also looking to acquire competitors. It is going to be a very difficult period for your business to grow organically over the next few months and, and beyond. And in this period, if you want to grow your business, you probably need to grow your business through market share, and to grow market share, uh, one way to do that is through acquiring competitors. The other thing is to consider is around maintaining remote and virtual ways of working and how that might impact uh, business. Uh, and on this one, the feedback there is we're getting from members is, is quite diverse. Some businesses have found it really helpful. Others have found it really challenging, this remote working. Uh, partly that's techno technological. Uh, but also it seems to be businesses of a smaller scale are really struggled with uh, and have really started to struggle with elements of remote working. But if, if we are seeing uh, a stronger focus on remote working or working from home, or as someone said, living at, living at work, uh, that's going to flow through to commercial, uh, commercial property sector. So we, we do know I do know of businesses which are in the process of re renegotiating leases and reducing their floor space from three floors in a, in a Melbourne CBD office to, to one floor, but they're not reducing their staff. So how is that going to in, impact other sectors? And it's always important to um, look at the lessons learned. How can that impact upon your, how can you take those lessons learned and improve your business? So, and it's you know, quite simple things like, was your technology up to, up to scratch when the crisis, had, crisis hit? Could your business staff work from home quickly? Uh, little things like, do you invoice immediately? Uh, you might think that's normal, but I can tell you it's, just, it's actually more abnormal than what you think. Businesses sometimes delay invoicing. And also, they're not really chasing up their debt. So there are more and more tools out there to help you chase up your debt. Uh, I, and cyber security. Cyber security has been an issue, particularly for people working at home. Is it still adequate? Also, we, we have a, heard a lot from members that those, who, those businesses who had strong customer relationships have done better in supplier relationships. Uh, and they've, the feedback was there's sort of a more of a partnership with their customers and suppliers. So they're all feeling they're all in this together and let's, how can we work together to get through this in the best possible way? So, and maybe um, that means, uh, for example, one, one example was uh, one of our members uh, unilaterally cut his uh, billing charges by 10% across the board because he knew customers would come and ask. So we decided to get in before they started asking. And, and that 
led to him actually picking up customers in this strange time rather than losing customers. And obviously, does flexible working arrangements work for your business? The next thing we'll move on to is reinventing your business. So, her businesses are doing well. Maybe you're, you're into this stage where let's, let's look at how is is the business we have now the right business for the future? And all the businesses are going to go through this. As I said before, COVID nineteen is changing the nature of business. COVID nineteen is changing the way uh, customers consume products and services and is changing the way which we work and don't work. And that's going to need to be reflected in how your business looks in the future. And the main thing here is around, not just about development of strategy, but the implementation of strategy. And the other key element here is technology. So if you see the business must reinvent themselves to exploit the changes in preferences. So while, you're, while many of your, your business may not be directly customer, you know, consumer facing, many of your clients are consumer facing businesses and they're going to reinvent themselves. How are you going to reinvent yourself in response to how your clients are working? So it's very clear that external shops at this scale are going to impact um, the way business is done and it's going to change. I mentioned before about e-commerce and contactless commerce is critical to this. There's also an interesting um, evolution around supply chain. So in, in the past, supply chain has been driven by costs, trying to find the least costs provider. And we have seen that in this, uh, in this uh, crazy time we're in, that if we rely too much on a um, low cost provider in times of crisis, they may not come through. So there's going to be a greater focus on supply chain value. And, and, and that could mean, for example, a pickup in the manufacturing sector in Australia. Now, I don't expect there to be a large scale manufacturing renaissance in Australia, but I think there's going to be a lot more small scale manufacturing as businesses look to uh, protect their supply chain risk. We're also likely to see uh, a lot more manufacturing move from China to other other economies. I'm not saying Australia or the US, I'm talking more, for example, Vietnam, Indonesia, but they are likely to pick up a lot of business as businesses look to reduce their China exposure. Data analytics is going to be fundamental in this point to inform you of customer trends, and also where to drive efficiencies. So investing in data and link software, which is becoming uh, cheaper, I think is, is a good way to go. We're also going to see some opportunities emerge. So there are going to be some businesses which are going to struggle. And if you are looking to grow your market share, uh, those businesses would be the prime target for uh, potential acquisition or a merger. And the one thing that's come through in every discussion I've had is digital transformation projects will become a key, key issue. So robotic process automation, artificial intelligence uh, to help streamline operations. And while there might be some staff losses, there also will be uh, empowering some employees to better engage with customers. And by that, I mean, um, for example, in the accounting space, there is a quite a lot of manual processes that some businesses still undertake. But your, your accountant is much more skilled than someone who can just do data entry. If those sort of um, data entry type roles can be automated, it frees up your accounting staff to actually do more higher value adding staff via higher value adding tasks, which uh, help can guide your strategy into the future. Uh, every year, every year we do a, an annual survey of um, small businesses across the Asia Pacific, and we find that 
Uh, these are sort of the key con key themes almost year in, year out around uh, the drivers of business growth. Now, over the last few years, technology has become a much more important driver of business growth. And I think, well, I know that COVID-19 will actually expedite the importance of technology for business growth. Also, if you look at number seven there, increasing your focus on developing and implementing strategy. As I said, we had a very large shock to our economy and to the business system, and strategy will have to change in, in, uh, in response. So strategy will be a very important part of the business going forward. I think, um, and learning more about customers, so I did talk about that, and that technology helps fill, fill that void, as well as the traditional face-to-face. -face. I think it was also important to dedicate time for learning about industry trends, so, and emerging technologies in your industry. And I think the best way to do that is to remain engaged with your industry association, ASIOL and others not just in Australia, but potentially going to, when we can travel to international conferences. So please remain engaged with your industry association. And history, well, experience shows that, to me, that businesses are more engaged with their industry and their industry associations are more likely to be growing and more likely to be successful. The other one that keeps coming up is around increasing your uh, social media presence. So, uh, more and more your consumers are going to look at your, when they hear about your business, they will look at, they will judge you based on what, what's in your social media profile. So that's something to, else to consider. So this is um, the recommendations that CPA Australia have developed for business in this period. And this has been informed by our engagement with members, uh, not just in Australia, but overseas. So continue to focus on improving cash flow and look at your financial health is the key one. Increase your investment in technology um, to meet the changing needs of your consumers, but also to understand the changing needs of the customers, your customers as well. Capitalise on your existing pool of loyal customers. Leverage your loyal customers to generate revenue because it's it's going to be hard to grow at this point in time. But seek opportunities to maybe acquire a competitor. Maintain your focus on cost control. I don't necessarily go over the top. As I said, the old saying, penny wise, pound foolish. Some businesses do go over the top in cost control and they eat away at their business's ability to actually service their clients. And that becomes a a downward spiral, which is very hard to stop. And as I said before, keep an eye open to opportunities that may emerge in the recovery. There are going to be opportunities um, and it will may require some investment, but it could set your, your business up for long-term growth if you do take advantage of those opportunities. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll move over to uh, questions and answers. So if you do have any questions and answers, please put them in the chat box. What I'll also do is I'll share um, the resources um, with all the participants after this, this meeting. So there's a whole range of resources we have available. I, I did, uh, was remiss of me not to include this slide in the presentation. Um, so at the moment, I actually can't see those questions for some reason. So maybe, Anna, if you can cut and paste them. I can see your comments, but not uh, from others. Okay, I have some questions come through. So one question is how many 
businesses do you expect to sh shut their doors because of COVID-19? So this is an interesting question. So we, we do get asked that question a lot. Um, and there's two elements. So there's the insolvency element. So people go into, businesses go into insolvency or bankruptcy, and those are just uh, shut their doors and walk away. During the GFC, around about 10,000 companies went into insolvency. Uh, we expect that number to be higher than that, but this, this time around, given the extent of the crisis. Um, so and that's, that's about 10,000. And in a normal year, there's around about three to 4,000 insolvencies. So one problem is that the insolvency sector, there's around about 600 insolvency practitioners. The insolvency sector actually doesn't have the resources to deal with more than 10,000 insolvencies in a year. So there's, uh, there's a potential crisis brewing in that sector. The other thing is uh, businesses just closing the doors and walking away. So the ABS put out some data uh, recently to show that 35% um, of businesses uh, expect it will be difficult or very difficult for them to meet their financial obligations over the next three months. So 35%, so there's 2.4 million businesses. So that's around about 830,000 businesses that have some sort of financial difficulties, financial stress. Of the 35%, 7% said that it'd be very difficult. So that's about 7% of businesses expect uh, very difficult circumstances in the next three months. So that's around about 160,000 businesses in severe financial pressure. So they're the ones that probably end up closing. And I'm not sure whether it'd be the 466,000, some will battle through, but there's going to be a good proportion of that that will close their doors or sell their business. Also, the ABS did a survey asking JobKeeper recipients what they will do after they no longer receive JobKeeper, and about 10%, well, actually 10% said they would close their doors. So there's 900,000 businesses receiving JobKeeper, so about 10%, 90,000 said they were going to close their doors. Another question here is how should businesses manage their supply chain risks? So one thing that became clear even in early this year uh, when uh, China was going through the worst of its crisis, uh, worst of its COVID crisis, that had impact upon supplies coming into Australia. And that was across many sectors. So for example, in the building construction sector, uh, they there's a lot of supplies they get from China that they couldn't get through. So to, in that sense, to manage your supply chain risk, you, ne you need to have alternate supplies. And those alternate supplies you need to test, identify and test. And you need to make sure they're not from the same geographic area or they themselves are not supplying from the same uh, uh, company. So if you're in the property construction sector and you want to import, say, a particular building material, what you should be doing now is going around and identifying a supply from another country. That could be Australia, it could be Vietnam, it could be anywhere. But then to also go back a step further and ask that alternate supplier, where are you getting your supplies from? Because you don't want a situation where you're having one supplier from China and one supplier from Vietnam, but they're both sourcing from the same area. So but it is time to look at the value of your supply chain and maybe have a stronger focus in a lot local suppliers. So any, any further questions there, Anna? Here we go, there is one. Um, what's the economic outlook for 2021? So I believe that towards the second half of 2021, we'll start to get back to some degree of uh, normality or where we were at the start of 2020. But that's all dependent on issues like a vaccine being widely available. Um, that's dependent on there being no further lockdowns. If we do go through further lockdowns, then that economic recovery will be delayed. So, it's going to be a difficult period. I think 
we're going to have a we're going to start to see a bit of a recovery in the second half of this year, as far in the last quarter of this year. But as JobKeeper and other support is taken off, then we'll start to see a dip back. So you know, not, it's not just JobKeeper. There is a commercial rent relief. There is also loan, um, loan deferrals of banks. Once those measures have started to be taken off, we're likely to see uh, a bit of a reversal of growth. So it is going to be a bit up and down. Uh, but it will, it will emerge. We won't, we're not in a V-shaped recovery as we expected early on. Um, whether we are in a W depends on uh, whether there's third, fourth, and fifth uh, waves of the, of the uh, virus. Um, is any other questions coming through, Anna? Here we go. So the question is, how do you think the shift to working remotely will play out? Will it lead to reduced demand for office space? Um, so how will um, it play out? So I, I, as I said before, there are businesses in Melbourne already looking at reducing their commercial office space uh, in, in, uh, relation, in direct response to working from home. So that might then flow through to uh, uh, people that service properties and look after properties, including the security industry. Uh, it also flows through to the businesses, you know, the shops and you know, the cafes and the others that support those businesses in CBDs. It doesn't mean that people won't, won't go into the office. It just means they might work um, more regularly from home and businesses will use more rostering. So they, they probably will look at you know, not having a full 100% in the office, but maybe 50% or 30%, at least for the foreseeable future. The other thing to look at is how will it play out in the retail space? So in, uh, we are likely to see um, a reduction in a um, number of retail outlets and then moving more to uh, working online. So we could see an inc a shift from business uh, retail outlets and shopping centres to having uh, a wholesale presence in uh, an industrial estate. So there might be a pickup in industrial property, particularly warehousing. And then, so that it might play out that way. So commercial property values might come down, but maybe the industrial warehousing property values might go up. And there's a question here is how do I find out more about technology trends impacting the security industry? Well, I think the main thing is to be uh, continue to be engaged with webinars like this from your industry association, ASIL. I think they're the best source of uh, intelligence on your trends in your industry. But also it's important to keep in contact with your colleagues and just keep reading. And don't necessarily believe what a software seller is trying to sell you. Speak to your colleagues first, have a look at what your industry association is saying. There's a lot of people out there who, who will have all sorts of uh, potential technology solutions for your business. Not all of them are the right technology solutions for your business. Speak to people about them. Don't just rely on what a technology seller is selling to you. Speak to your, speak to your accountant. They might have a view on whether uh, a technology it is a good value value for investment. I think the main thing here is to keeping up to date. I think the main thing in keeping up to date is re, keep engaged with your ASIL and keep engaged with your colleagues in the industry and just ask them questions. They're more than likely to share. And also, the other tip is uh, have a look at what's happening internationally. So, yeah, tip, the tips are have a look at what's happening internationally. Keep engaged with ASIL and your body and your other industry players. Don't necessarily believe what a software person is trying to sell to you. Test it and speak to your staff. They might have some ideas as well. So I think that's all for the questions. Look, I just want to thank you for your time in today's presentation and I hope you've got something out of it. Uh, following the presentation, I think we'll provide a series of links to publications 
um, that CBA Australia have developed, which uh, hopefully you can apply in your business. So once again, thank you for joining us for the recording and the recording will be provided at the end of this session. So have a lovely day and thank you to Aziel, Anna, Brenda for all your assistance in this uh, session. Thank you very much.